Welcome to our first uh, wellness day. We've never had a wellness day here. So we've got the vendor fair out in the courtyard. Y'all probably got to check out. We've got this talk. So really happy that you're here. Uh, this panel is the intersection of wellness and technology. So we've got a bunch of experts here to talk to us about it. We're a tech company. We're very concerned about that intersection. Um, as you know, Google is a leader in workplace health and wellness. We have our GFIT program, we have nutrition, we have massage therapy, but we also recognize that we have a lot to learn. So that is why we have these folks here today. I'm going to introduce them and then we'll ask some questions. We'll leave time for audience questions at the end. This is also being filmed, so it'll be on our YouTube channel in a few weeks and y'all can post it and watch it then. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So first, I'm going to try to get all the names right, the pronunciation. So Andy Petronic. Did I nail it? So Andy's the founder of CrossFit LA and the Whole Life Challenge, which is really amazing. My husband and I did it, and I highly recommend everyone do it. It's life-changing. Um, then we've got Dice Ida Klein. Dice is a yoga instructor at Yoga Glow and, if I might say, a world-class handstand master. Uh, I've been taking his videos for years, and I'm a really big fan. Y'all have got to check him out. You will, your mind will be blown. Um, Kim Whitman, who's the founder and executive producer of Yoga Today. It's a beautiful site of yoga classes filmed in nature, and so everyone should definitely check that out. Jeff Egler, it's the MD and medical director at Parsley Health. This is a really cool company. It's redefining medical care with a root cause, whole person approach and focus on data, technology, and real doctor-patient relationships, which we all want and appreciate. And then lastly, Tom Freeman is the learning and development manager at Headspace. Headspace is out in the courtyard. You're probably also familiar with it, meditation app. I can personally attest to the effectiveness of that app. It's really great. And Googlers get a really good discount. So check it out, putting in a plug for all y'all. So let's get started. I'm going to just ask some questions. We'll go down the line and then um, leave time for y'all to ask questions as well. So just briefly, we'll just go down the line, starting with Andy. Tell us briefly what led you into the wellness profession. What factors motivated you to get to where you are today? It's an interesting question. We were talking about my varied background. <clears throat> so I'm, I got to go kind of quick because it's very varied. <laughs> I was kind of forced into it. I was a Marine back in the early 90s, and I had to get in shape to be in the Marines, and I didn't really realize at the time, but I was, it was my first introduction to being a fitness coach. I was responsible for a platoon of men going, going to war and made, had to make sure that they were fit and ready to go. And lo and behold, that became my profession. Four years after leaving the Marines, I, I uh, started racing. I started doing professional adventure racing, sponsored by Red Bull, um, it's like a, it's like triathlon meets, um, I don't know, extreme sports. We would rock climb and kayak and, and mountain bike and, you know, three, four, 500 mile races. And, uh, um, people started to ask me what I was doing to be in shape and I would tell them what I did. And then they would say, well, can you, can you, can you write a program for me or can you train me? And that's how I got my first clients and I became a fitness coach. And then, and I started going down the road of, of kind of more holistic. I, I worked with Paul Check at the Czech Institute in San Diego, and I, and I started go, to go down the road toward being a, um, a wellness and a corrective exercise specialist. Um, and then I discovered CrossFit, and it kind of changed my, the context of my training because I started having so much fun with workouts again and training again. Um, uh, I opened up. CrossFit Los Angeles, which was one of the first 10 CrossFits in the world, and um, was really responsible in the beginning of that movement for develop, um, delivering a lot of the pub, uh, publicity for the movement for CrossFit around the world, even though I just owned a little gym in Santa Monica. And the Whole Life Challenge came out of my desire as a coach to uh, to affect what people, the choices people made in their everyday life outside the gym. Because if they could do, they could come see me two, three, four times a week at the gym, but what would they do when they weren't at the gym? And that was really the mother load for me. And my, my business partner, Michael Stanwick, is my, she, he's, he and I are co-founders of the challenge. He was my head coach at CFLA. And uh, we were searching for this answer and we knew it was not just in exercise. So we built this whole life challenge around a, a holistic approach, which is food and stretching and mobility and um, clarity of mind, 
um, gratitude, um, reflection on, on how you're doing. And we put it together in a way that builds community. So we kind of stumbled upon this format and grew it from 150 in the first challenge to we had 23,000 people around the world do the one in January, which is always our biggest of the year. So um, that's really it. Yeah. Uh, my so what the question is me venturing into the health and wellness industry yeah, how did you or how did I get in? Um, well, I mean, let me just say I think early on, being a kid, I realized the, the direct correlation between um, physical fitness or at least um, moving my body and how that helped more my mental state or, or the ability to almost relax or calm down. Um, I played a lot of sports throughout um, my younger years, all the way through high school into college. I was a big gym rat. Um, but I'd never really touched upon yoga. But um, I started working for a little company called Lululemon uh, at one point. And at the time, they, they allowed their employees to um, uh, take any form of physical fitness, go into the physical fitness world. As long as you wore their apparel, you could take the class for free. So I ventured into so many things that I never thought I would touch. And um, um, this is right after I'd graduated from UCLA. Um, and I basically tried a yoga class. and. Uh, yeah, I, I fell in love with yoga. And I never really thought I would be able to share it or teach it. That wasn't really the idea. But um, I did realize that there was this, this strong connection between mind-body and, and how um, I was always so physically active, but I realized I needed to be physically active to, I think, um, be able to handle what's going on up here. And I think that goes for most human beings in general. Um, and once you start to realize that connection, um, things start to go in a good direction. Um, but. Um, the ability to actually share what, what I'm able to practice and teach really came from um, the company that I'm fortunate enough to work for, Yoga Glow. Um, they're really bringing, I think, yoga to the masses in a way that some people are in remote areas or can't really uh, get to a public yoga class. We're, we're able to reach out to them and at least be with them in their home and, and provide some sorts of clarity, serenity, I mean, all the things that I think we're all looking for. So um, I don't know. I, I guess I would say I just stumbled into the health and wellness um, realm. I didn't really intend upon it. It wasn't something that I was so keen on getting to, but I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate and blessed to be able to actually be a part of it in some, some tiny little way. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And like Dice, I also am someone who stumbled into, actually fell. I crashed on my skis in Argentina. <laughs> had this horrible injury that I was recovering for seven months, crushed my leg, had all these surgeries. And so, yeah, I, like many people who find yoga, it's because of an injury. Um, you know, you, you never seek health and wellness until you don't have it, which is something Parsley knows about. So anyways, um, yeah, so I came back and was, I was in Jackson Hole, you know, uh, being sort of a ski bum for a couple years after grad school. I actually did study engineering, which is not what, so now I say I'm in, I'm in the business of renewable energy, but in the human form. So it's all come full circle. Um, but yeah, so anyways, we, I was recovering from this ski accident and I was doing a ton of yoga. I'd always done tons of sports in college, in high school. I was an athlete, skier, lacrosse, swimmer, rower. Um, and I've never been in better shape than when I was doing eight to 10 yoga classes a week. Um, I can say that fully. And I've, you know, been in the gym and the weight room and all this. So um, I was just floored by not just the physical, but also the mental conditioning that you get from the practice of yoga. And then it goes into the whole whole life challenge thing. Like, then you start, you, you're in this vein of wellness and all of a sudden you're starting to make better decisions about what you eat because you don't want to have a hamburger in your belly when you're in yoga class doing a handstand. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, speaking a little kinder to people and you're making better choices in, t in terms of every life decision. So yoga is one of those things that just permeates your whole life and all of a sudden you're in it. Like you don't even mean to. It's like sneaky form of exercise. Like you don't mean to, <laughs> you don't know. You're thinking, oh, I'm gonna go stretch. And like, oh, you kind of get your butt kicked. Um, so yeah, um, I am also extremely grateful for falling into yoga, quite literally, and, uh, and the path that it's taken us on. Um, we started the yoga show, you know, as a content carrot for a larger investment for a different um, company altogether, and then so many people were loving it, we spun it out into its own business. 
Um, it was like on the top 10 podcasts in iTunes in 2006 up there with like, NP you know, people were consuming it ravenously, writing in saying like, what, what are you doing? You're putting an hour yoga show filmed in nature in HD online and you're giving it away for free. Like this is too good to be true. And of course it was. Um, but, and so people were consuming it ravenously. They were like, well, we don't want to miss one. I'm doing yoga every day now because of this show. And like, what's going on? I'm losing all this weight or I'm getting over this depression or, so the letters that were pouring in were so moving, um, that we couldn't turn it off when like the larger investment that we made it for was turned off. And so we spun it out, didn't, did the freemium thing before Pandora went to Pandora One, and like we didn't know if anyone was gonna pay for content online. So it's been this like complete evolution um, from the wild, because we're in Jackson Hole. So we're doing it all from a media vacuum, <laughs> which has been interesting. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been a wild ride during this time when the internet's sort of taking over television to stumble into it as an outsider. I feel really blessed. But most of all, to stumble into yoga as an outsider and now be an insider and like realize it's changed my whole life and be so grateful for the people that it's put me in contact with. Um, so yeah, that's how it happened. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Now you have one. Okay. Uh, my name's Jeff Egler. I'm the medical director of Parsley Health here in Los Angeles. And thank you for having us here. This is a lot of fun. It's great to come out and talk about what we're doing and to share it with people. I think I have an interesting answer for you. Uh, interesting in that I feel like even as a physician trained in an allopathic conventional manner, an MD, I also stumbled into health and wellness. Um, and I after practicing medicine for more than a decade. And what I mean by that is, um, I, I think you've all heard this, I think it's probably becoming a bit of a cliche, but my opinion, and I'm not alone here, is that we don't really have a disease, we, we don't really have a health care system in our country, we have more of a disease management uh, system in our country. And quite frankly, it doesn't really even do a good job of managing disease. And so I had been practicing as a physician. Initially, I chose to be a physician because I started in engineering, which is something that many of you might be able to relate to. And I really loved the science and the math. And as I started to study more of this, I started to realize that the application that I wanted to was in the human form. I wanted to solve problems in, uh, with people. So I went into medicine, and that's where I spent my attention for the first decade or so, which is finding disease and trying to fix that, rather than focusing on health and wellness. And so, quite honestly, I can say, looking back now, it's very ironic that I wasn't trained, really, nor did I really think in terms of keeping people healthy. I was looking for disease and then trying to get them back to health, but really that horse was already sort of out of the barn. So moving into what we do now at Parsley Health, you may be familiar with some of the terms functional medicine, integrative medicine, holistic. We don't necessarily attach or identify ourselves in any of those one ways, but that is the line that we're taking. And the reason we don't attach to it is because we really feel like we take the best of everything. We have the science training to look out there amongst all the different health modalities and really take the best and incorporate them in a personalized way for the individual. Um, and I got to that by really realizing after a decade in medicine, I wasn't taking really good care of myself. And I was teaching at USC, I was teaching doctors to be doctors. And as I started to take better care of myself, I started asking more questions about what I was eating and how I was sleeping and of course reducing stress and exercising. And as I started to translate that into teaching my uh, physicians in training to do that with their patients, they were looking at me like deer in the headlight. You, need, you know I don't have time to talk about that. I just need to diagnose, prescribe, get to the next room. And so I realized that I, I, could, I didn't fit into that model anymore. And luckily at that time, Parsley Health was coming up, and now I get to practice medicine and health uh, in the way that fits for me a lot better. Thanks. Cool. Thanks very much for yeah, having us. Um, so yeah, I think my story, if there's one thing which kind of pulls it all together, I think it's the idea of like demystifying something. So probably starting back in my school days, university, you guys say school, um, I had this real passion to kind of study business psychology, so the psychology of organizations and how they work. 
But at the same time, it was quite rooted in this idea of training and people as like numbers, and that didn't really interest me. But this huge idea of like wellness and getting more from yourself it kind of came across that quite a lot. This idea of mindfulness, um, which doesn't have to be this religious thing, it can be this practical thing, which anyone can do. Um, that kind of was getting quite a lot of traction around there in the literature and loads and loads of papers coming about it. At the same time, I was like super stressed out, like exam season was coming along, you guys called them finals, like you probably relate to, it's a pretty stressful time. So I went and saw this therapist, part of the university offering, and kind of he suggested I take up meditation and give this thing a try. And I was amazed at like how first, how, how, how quickly, like how practical this thing was. Um, you can read a book on it and you don't have to go off to a monastery in Asia and burn incense and wear robes. Like it's something you can do in your dorm room um, or with friends. And I think like, wow, like this thing's really powerful. This thing can turn around your relationship with stress, anxiety, performance, all that kind of stuff. So that was that. So I kind of finished off my, my education, did my master's, um, started meditating. Um, and then I kind of found Headspace. And again, like Headspace has got this really interesting mission. I know people are probably familiar with it. Um, but we had this mission to demystify meditation. Again, we have, we have our co-founder, um, Andy, who spent 10 years um, trained to become a monk and um, brought it back to, to the West and in London and had this clinic where he would see people one-on-one -on -one and um, teach them mindfulness exercises. And I kind of, kind of came across Headspace a few years ago um, when we were quite small back in London. And like this, this mission of demystifying this thing, like with the work stuff at university, I was interested in like demystifying work, like how it doesn't have to be this thing where you're tied to a desk for eight hours a day, you can do it anywhere you want. Um, like looking at things like employee well-being are really, really important. So that was kind of like the demystifying of work piece. But then Headspace came along and was like, well, these guys are trying to demystify this really, really old thing, which is rooted in all this teaching and these trainings and like bringing it to like a, a modern way of thinking, a modern way of life. Um, so those two kind of things came together and I joined Headspace um, back in London um, a few years ago when we were quite small. And um, yeah, that for me was just being part of that mission um, was yeah just a huge part of how I kind of, well, my practice in particular, kind of, um, yeah, how, how looking after the mind and seeing it as this everyday thing, which doesn't have to be this really religious thing. I think that's a really important way of looking at it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my journey from education to, to work. And um, it's funny being here, actually, we used to be one block from here, um, around the corner. We used to walk past this place all the time. Um, had office envy, big time. Um, so yeah, don't worry. But yeah, we moved a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, that's my journey. And now I'm kind of working in learning development. And before this, my role was culture manager. So in terms of the behaviors and the culture of an organization, how do you kind of build a place which fits your brand, which takes well-being really seriously, um, which encourages your employees to meditate and take good breaks and look after their minds at work. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I got here. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And I find it so interesting that we often think of health as physical and everyone's touching upon the spiritual, psychological. I mean, three of y'all have psychology degrees, so I think that's very interesting. Um, so thank you so much. Um, next question. So we are talking about the intersection of technology and wellness. So we, we do want to dive into that. So how have you seen technology impact the wellness space in a positive way? And then on the opposite, have you seen negative impacts from technology on the wellness field? So you can just go right back down the line. Um, you know, our, we wouldn't have a business without technology. We wouldn't have a business without Facebook or without Google or without, you know, the, the interaction of community or the building of community online has been such a powerful um, tool. The hard part, the interesting part for us was, was how to do that effectively so that you didn't, so that it was a valuable space to spend time in and it wasn't just another recreation of Facebook um, or you know a place that people already were. So um, I'm you know, forever indebted to technology for the, the, my whole life. I mean, it's, I'm so grateful that, that life has brought me here. I can work out of, out of the comfort of my home and, um, you know, communicate with 20,000 people at a time doing the whole life challenge. And they can interact with me. You know, they can interact with the game. They can score themselves. They can do things that, they, that wouldn't be allowed. I think one of the challenges for me are around... Um, health and mindfulness and, uh, and technology is this insatiable need for people to think that they think they need more data, they need more information. 
Um, and I and I think that without the consciousness, like one of the things that we don't do in the Whole Life Challenge, we don't partner, we've never partnered with Fitbit or connected an, um, uh, an automatic step tracker or habit tracker. We, we want people to actually have to do it manually. We want people to be conscious. We want people to be aware of what they're doing so that they're actually making choices about the way they spend their time and they're aware of how, they're, how they spend their time. If it's too automatic, uh, it's, it's just easy to lose track of. I've done it myself. I mean, I've experimented with every fitness tracker known to man. I actually love fitness trackers. But when I don't, when I have the, um, when I get all this data, it takes time to actually go in and look at the data. And then what data do you look at? And what's important? And what, you know, how do you not get lost in that? So, you know, really for, for, whole, life, for whole Life Challenge, it's, it's not anti-data. It's be aware of what you're doing. And if the data supports what you're, you know, if, if it supports you to have a goal of walking 15,000 steps in a day and it gets you moving, fantastic. Um, don't just shoot for 15,000 steps because you, because that's what Fitbit tells you what to do. So. Um, technology and positives and possible rooms for improvement, I guess. Um, uh, room for improvement. Um, well, I, working for Yoga Glow, I mean, I touched upon it already with just my brief intro, but um, I mean, one of the positives is really brought I think just health and wellness to the masses, or at least to people that are looking to improve upon um, themselves. Um, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's it's a wonderful way also to create community. Or I mean, kind of like Andy was saying, was being able to not globalize, but being able to connect with people around the globe that are doing maybe the same things as you, or thinking the same way as you. Um, and so I think technology in general is just helping us to I don't know bridge the gap between people that seem so far away. Um, it's really bringing a global community together. Um, negative aspects, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's necessarily negative, but I think as cliche as it may sound, the one thing that I think you hear a lot in yoga is um, this, this idea of being in the now or, or being in the present moment. Um, and I feel like at times with technology, because you may have a, a Fitbit tracker or something that's tracking your steps or you have a goal that you're looking for, you tend to either weigh on the side of the past or the future and you're always kind of going back and forth between the two, which is normal and it should happen. That's how you can assess a situation and move forward or make changes as needed. But um, oftentimes we forget that, I mean, again, it's cliche, but everything you have, I mean, everything you need is right here, right now. And if you can sometimes put the phone down or put even yoga glow down or whatever it may be, you can, <laughs> you, I mean, you can realize that. Don't say that. Yeah, yeah, don't say that, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think all I'm saying is that sometimes technology yeah, yeah. <laughs> technology could take us out of the moment. And, and you start to realize that a lot of times the, the, the most important thing is to realize that the, the things that you do along the way to your goal, those are what matter more. That's kind of the gift, the ability to see how you actually got somewhere versus where you're trying to go or even where you've been. But just being there now, yeah. <laughs> No, and I, you know, agree with everything you said, and I don't want to repeat, but that's exactly right. It does take you out of the moment. I do think, like, it's good in that um, you're able to put your art form, which, whether it's yoga or whatever, CrossFit, into the world and find your people. Lovely. Love that. You know, I have people from the Netherlands that I'm friends with now that I wouldn't be because of yeah, without yoga today or all over the world. But um, yeah, the the drawback, I, and I don't know if it's a drawback, I think it's just, we're in a conversation right now. You know, this is not something black and white, like good or bad. Um, we're in the gray right now, like with uh, how to manage the, it, I, I don't, I'm sure everyone saw Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes and doing the cell phone tests. He's hooked up and he's literally giving off, his brain is giving off the, the same chemicals that you get from cocaine by, you know, checking his phone. You know, it's an addiction. People are de device addicted. Um, you get that little hit, hit of like dopamine when you get a like on your Instagram and Instagram's like withholding likes so that they come in in bulk now. You know, all these things, it's like, 
<laughs> tech companies are are intentionally designing these things to be addictive. And as humans, it's like we have to decide, okay, well, and as, as creators of technology, we have to decide, well, what is, let's have that conversation and let's decide what is in the best interest. It's like, you know, the whole GMO debate. It's like, yeah, well, we can solve vitamin A deficiencies in populations by inserting some vitamin A in rice, but like, then what are the, cons you know, it's like, there's good and there's bad and, and we're in the dialogue and I'm sure we'll look back on this time as like, oh wow, this is you know the time then, that they were scrambling to figure it out culturally. But I like to be an optimist and think that technology really does solve problems and in general, our lives will be better for it. So yeah, I guess I'm ambiguous on this, <laughs> but I agree with, with what you said. <laughs> Agree uh, with with uh, most, if not all, of it. Uh, tech, we've always had technology from you know the beginning of man. Uh, fire is a technology, uh, and we will always have technology to a certain degree. And we are evolving with our technology, and it is really interesting um, how quickly we're evolving with our technology. You know the differences between generations uh, that we actually have to split generations into different generations uh, because things are moving and changing and adapting so quickly as an example of that technology um, you know I think that the crisis that we started to see in terms of obesity and diabetes and increased heart disease and things like that probably starting around the 80s uh, because of the food industry which is a technology and certainly uh, food industry made things cert a lot more convenient for us but at what cost? And so I think that uh, through education, we're starting to reverse some of those things. So those are some of the things that I think were technology, and we're probably not talking about the technology that we're used to talking about in this room, but that's where I think some of the negatives have been. Um, positives, like Andy said, you know, um, part of what we do at Parsley Health is in addition, of course, to, to seeing patients, um, we are able to communicate with them through technology. We actually don't even have a phone line because we do all of our communications through a secure portal where patients can ask a question and get an answer within 24 hours. And we have somebody scanning it to make sure if there's an emergency that gets addressed immediately. Um, we're a 21st century practice where I don't think a lot of doctors are utilizing this fully, but um, we can do telemedicine. So it doesn't really matter where your office is located anymore. I spoke with a patient today who's in Florida. Um, so that technology wasn't available. We do blogs and offer uh, patients information on a regular basis that way that wasn't available to us five, 10 years ago, at least in the way that it is now. Um, talking a little, so that's all wonderful stuff. And we, we integrate technology into our decision-making processes by having people, we, tip, we typically order a lot more labs that we use as biomarkers because we have the technology. You know, medicine has uh, a tendency to lag way behind uh, other technologies. And so in many ways, um, the, the typical doctor out there is probably way behind in terms of the technology that's available of diagnosing problems, special tests, and most doctors, and I say this um, intelligently because five years ago I was most doctors and what I was teaching doctors was not the cutting edge stuff that we're doing now. Um, but we have to learn how to integrate that technology to understand it and explain it to people. But we're utilizing a lot of those things now because we're also looking at markers that that show what degree of health you're in, not just looking for, so the old, the old way was sort of looking at uh, markers for disease. And if you have this lab value, then you have this disease. But we can look at uh, more shades of gray now and keep people in the green rather than waiting until they're the yellow or the red. And just more quickly, I would also just add that I do have concerns about technology, especially our attachment to it. So, um, and I think that this is somewhat pseudo-generational. I'm a little bit older than my wife, for example, and we use our phones completely different, but there's only a you know, five-year, seven-year gap in there. Um, and the attachment to texting, or I can't have a moment sometimes with my family without having to capture it and Instagram it, or, uh, and that's concerning to me because I think I see so many people that are out on a hike and they stop and take a picture, like I'll look at that later, rather than actually taking in the beauty in the moment. So it is, again, back to being present. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting one. I mean, Headspace started as an events company um, quite a few years ago. So um, at first, we were kind of like just like this, you know, just speakers. And then 
We use technology to really think about how we could scale our product. And I mean, the vision of Headspace is to improve the health and happiness of the world. And doing that through the online means, we found that to be really, really powerful. But also we're kind of aware of this irony of like offering guided meditations, right, through a phone. It's a really common question. Like we get it from people and it comes in and yeah, like it's a great question. And we're aware of that, that irony. But at the same time, like it's been covered here, like it's all about that relationship with your phone. Your, the, the iPhone in your pocket or Android is just a lump of glass and metal and plastic, right? But like how you engage with that product is entirely up to you and your mind. That's where it starts. So that's kind of our, our perspective on that. And through mindfulness, you can kind of, I think you can learn to react and engage with that product in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so it's, it's actually quite interesting. Like every year we do a company retreat and for one day we take the team away from the office for a day. And part of that is that everyone kind of gives their phones to me um, and, and to our team. And like, in the morning, you kind of see these people thinking, oh, my, I haven't been on my phone for five years. I haven't checked. I've been a day without Instagram for three years. And like, you see this like, reaction. It's really, really interesting. And for some people, it's really hard. And kind of, we get it. But at the end of the day, like, whoa. Like, we had one last week. It was a whole day. It was like 12 hours without their phone. And at the end of the day, you're like, whoa. Like, people didn't, or I thought people were going to run to me saying, can I have my phone back? Can I have my phone back? And like, no one really ran to me asking for their phone back. People are like, whoa, this is amazing. Like, you know, I've had this whole day where I haven't had to take photos, up, up, upload things. So I think, in a way, like testing ourselves to see if we can do that is, is quite interesting, even for us, you know, a weekend uh, morning or something, just going and putting your phone um, away. So, like, there are positives and negatives, I think, in terms of scaling something. And if you have a phone and you're on the go and you want to train your mind and on, a, on a kind of on-the-go basis without going off to a monastery somewhere or putting robes on, you know, it's one way which technology, I think, can be really, really beneficial. And of course, you can get addicted to it. You know, I'm guilty of scrolling endlessly through Instagram and stuff. But as, at one point, you do, like, catch yourself. You catch your mind going, oh, this is actually pretty useless. This is pretty boring. Like, it's nice, like, showing your friends you care about them. But, like, it's not really showing you care about your friends. It's you just ticking a picture. So, like, at some point, like, if you, like, you know, I'm definitely not an expert in this, but, like, through training and looking how you do kind of your mind works, you can think, actually, this isn't a great use of your time. And that's you still just engaging with that bit of glass and plastic. But, like, it's kind of, yeah, I think you can, it starts with you, I think, and a big part of that. And also just to reference, like, the at work piece, because, you know, fully aware that as soon as you come in the office, you've got emails coming in, you've got slacks or whatever going on. And, like, yeah, like, it's just a big part of kind of, you know, startup life or business life, whatever that is. But I think companies can start thinking about technology in a different way. And one thing we, we do at Headspace is that we block out kind of no meeting blocks in your days. So one at 10 o'clock and one at 3 o'clock, we have these blocks when people don't have meetings. But in those times, people can go off and meditate if they want to. So they can kind of disengage from technology if they want and just sit and meditate for 10, 15 minutes. And we never force it, of course, but you can go outside, take a walk around the block, get some fresh air. But I think also companies really encouraging their employees to disengage with technology and seeing kind of better breaks and disengaging technology is actually a way of being more productive um, and engaging with technology in a different way. So there are a few different levels to it there probably, but um, it does ultimately start, I think, yeah, with your mind. So That is so awesome. I think we should start thinking about that at Google. It's a really good idea. Um, just as a personal anecdote to a couple of things y'all said, um, with the whole life challenge, I can say um, that there was a week where you could only check social media once a day, and it was hard. You know, you, we had to turn notifications off our phone. It's hard. Us, it's hard. Yeah. yeah, like that's, I think that's part of it is like if you want to move towards a lifestyle like that where you're only checking it, that way you've got to get the notifications off. Otherwise, you're like, oh, someone liked it. Oh, we got to look. Um, and then uh, on the positive, I wanted to say just an interesting story is that. Uh, years ago, I was in an international development field and was working in Afghanistan briefly and wanted to do yoga. And I learned about Yoga Glow um, and actually did a bunch of Dice's classes in Afghanistan where there was like barely any internet connection and, you know, really enhanced my practice. And so thinking on the positive side of technology, like and how you said there's a global community, I would have never had that without those kind of things. So I think it is all about the balance and not letting it take over your life, but using it to your advantage. So just some anecdotes. Um, so you kind of already, like Tom, you were already kind of talking about this, but this is a good segue. With, if you could, um, and you can, uh, what one piece of advice would you give to audience members who want to improve their overall well-being? One piece of advice. And we can start the other way. 
Spice it up. Go for it. Um, so yeah, this is me just speaking personally, um, but definitely taking some time out of your day to look after your mind. I think it starts with kind of just 10 minutes. I mean, through Headspace, you can do three minute meditations. You can do a one minute meditation if you're really, really busy, but kind of making a priority just for sitting there and doing nothing. I think as we're so busy, we're running around from meeting to meeting or getting to work or stuck in traffic, whatever that is, just blocking out that 10 minutes um, just to kind of have time for yourself, I think. And then the, the benefits, I'm speaking personally again here, but the benefits they can have on so many areas of your, le your life, sorry, in terms of your relationship with stress or anxiety. Like, there's no way I would have been up here on a panel two, year, two or three years ago. Um, it, I would put, put have been in the kitchen eating loads of food. Um, <laughs> but anyway, and I'm still not there, but that relationship with how you relate to everyday things, whether it's stress, anxiety, um, sport, um, eating, all of those things. I think if that starts with just taking time for yourself, um, yeah, personally, that's kind of, I've seen huge benefit in that. So just blocking out 10 minutes in your day, um, in the morning, maybe after you get up, before you brush your teeth, like personally also like anchoring it to like an everyday thing. Like it's another common, common question we get is like, I don't have the time to meditate. I don't have 10 minutes in my day. And you know, it, it, it can sound, yeah, some, some people it's like, whoa, 10 minutes doesn't sound very much. When you're busy, it, it is. Um, but find that time to anchor it into your day. So maybe after you brush your teeth, you know, hopefully everyone brushes their teeth here every day. If they don't, <laughs> it's cool. Um, but yeah, like anchor it to something you do every day and then just saying, okay, after I brush my teeth, I'm going to sit for 10 minutes before I go to work, before I jump in the car, and then it's done for the day. And that can help you set up your, your whole day in a different way. Um, for some people, it's in the evening. For some people, it's... After lunch at work, just finding a, a room at work to do that in. Whatever that works for you, whatever time works for you, I think just finding that time um, somewhere that's quiet, somewhere that's private, and just, yeah, finding 10 minutes for yourself, I think is a good start. Thanks for that. I, it's hard to come up with something that's more important than that. I, I would say my off-the-cuff doctor answer is um, food food matters. But I think because that's sort of uh, probably more obvious to some of the people in the room, I would say that maybe a more unique answer to me would be, um, so I was talking a few minutes ago about technology and how all of us here can actually have a doctor in their home. But I think many of us would probably think twice about having a doctor in their home. Do I really want a doctor on my screens in my home or at my place of work? And that's what we're trying to do at Parsley is really change the relationship of people with a doctor and change what a doctor means. Um, I don't want to be somebody that comes to me um, when they're sick uh, looking for a medication. I want to have relationships with younger people that we start to talk about health. And what Tom was saying before about, you know, some of us feel like we don't have 10 minutes in a day to meditate. And I would say if that's your mentality, you've probably got a lot bigger problems than that. Uh, and when I, what I mean by that is you probably have a lifestyle that's not going to really work out so well for you in the long term. And so having somebody that you trust, whether it's a physician or a different type of provider that can help you look objectively at your life at an early stage when you think things are going well and maybe start to accumulate some data. I agree with Andy that we don't want to necessarily, don't need to always um, obsess about minor pieces of data, but they can be helpful to kind of give us a reflection of if we are really as he uh, healthy as we think we are and to rethink some of our health habits. Yeah, all in agreement. And I have to say, though, the one thing that you should do is yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I'd say this was sponsored by Yoglers. <laughs> G-Paws. So. No. Well, and I only say that because I now preach meditation as my number one thing, but I would never have gotten there without yoga. It actually took me eight years of yoga practice, consistent yoga practice, and a yoga show that I happen to be running as well, to actually commit to a meditation practice. And I think the only reason was that yoga is a moving meditation. So as a monkey-minded person that can't sit still, and I like to ski and I'm always sore from doing something, I needed that like segue into meditation with a physical practice. And actually yoga was really designed just to prepare your body to sit for hours in meditation. And so it truly is the precursor to meditation. So if you can do both, then that's the way to go. And one more thing I want to say about meditation is I have started giving, you know, be gentle to yourself is the other piece of advice, I guess, that I have for everyone. And, and uh, you know, 
you don't have to be so hardcore. And like, so I've allowed myself to do the morning meditation in Shavasana in my bed with a little pillow over my eyes. And if I fall back asleep, it's okay. Cause I needed that extra sleep, but I do my 20 minutes every morning from my pillow and that's fine. It's, I don't have to be a monk. So, you know, start with that. And then if you can work it in, instead of going for the second cup of coffee in the afternoon, when you start to drag, go and do your second 20 minute, I mean, or 10 or whatever is three, you know, but yeah, yoga leads to meditation, which is the ultimate and be nice to yourself. Those are three pieces of advice. Um, I mean, I'm basically going to be saying the same thing I think that everybody said because they're all um, honest ways to really help yourself, especially if you're, I think, working with a tech company. Um, but definitely just to add on, I mean, I think being able to put down your technology is huge and it's so hard. Um, I know in, in my household, um, specifically, I have a four-year-old who, watching someone that young be so attracted to... <laughs> technology so early on, um, having to limit his use and even TV use, it's pretty amazing. It's made him much more, um, when, when I used to give him more technology, he honestly um, was so quick at, uh, I guess, um, it was instant gratification became more and more like apparent. He would want to change things so quickly, so often. And once I started to get him off of technology more and weaned him off of it, his ability to actually pay attention to one thing became a whole lot better. Um, so, and that's just a four-year-old who, who is really, I think, in the more present moment than many of us are as adults. Um, so as adults, if all you ever do is sit at a computer and you're on your phone and you're constantly having to stay connected with your business, your emails, all that, I think, although it may seem difficult and you're like, well, I run my life this way, I mean, taking 30 minutes or if you have a, a rule of like stepping into your home and literally dropping it into a bucket for an hour or something, that things like that will definitely help you out in the long run up here for sure. Um, I think on the more, I think meditation, the physical realm, yoga, asana, and all that, you know, with yoga, there's so many different realms. There's so many different limbs or legs to it, uh, you could say. And for most of us, we're a phys highly physical culture or be being really, right? So we really relate to our bodies, our physical self. The more we exercise or move, typically the better we feel up top. Um, but you start to realize that there are so many other elements that you can work on. And what it all comes down to, I think, personally, is you're just always working on self-improvement, self-betterment, self, I mean, self-awareness and realizing what things make you feel better. Also, what things make you tick, what things send you off the deep end, how you react to certain situations, people, things like that. The more you start to ask those kinds of questions about yourself and not necessarily be attached to a good or bad outlook on yourself, um, I think the better you're going to be in the long run. It'll make you a healthier person, especially if you're around something as amazing as technology that you guys are using all the time. Or you know, um, yeah. So I love this question because I've been asked it a lot, and I and in developing the whole life challenge have thought about it a lot because we we have a much broader context you know we have seven daily habits as opposed to you know and they're all important all these answers have been fantastic and they're all important so the question then is well where do I start and how do I you know where do I go and and what I always tell people is I mean there are two things um, the best way to start is to walk through the door you're willing to walk through you know like if somebody came into my gym and all they wanted to talk about was being able to do 100 push-ups. I wouldn't start talking to them about food or meditation or because that's not the door that they're willing to walk through. So if, you're, if you are considering you know, getting started down the health path, if you want to go down the meditation route, that's the route you should take. And that route, kind of like what you were saying is, is that leads to other things. Yoga leads to meditation. It might lead to push-ups. Um, you know, when you do enough chaturangas and fall on your face, you know, you, you, you might need to strengthen your upper body. Um, but, you know, take the path that you're willing to go through and, and use that as your, like, keystone. Like, we, we, we deal with habits a lot in the Whole Life Challenge. So use that as your keystone habit. And if you're willing to address, say, sleep in your life, great. If you improve your sleep by 20 minutes a night or you, you improve the quality of the, the, or the lack of light in your bedroom, 
fantastic and you start feeling a little bit better, then maybe you'll have a little bit more energy with which to deal with some of the stress that you're feeling with your spouse. And maybe when you start dealing with the stress that you're feeling with your spouse a little bit better, maybe that leads to, oh man, now I got the energy to work out and I'm going to actually get up in the morning and work out. So it's kind of like a, it's like a snowball effect and it's kind of a, it's a more meta answer. I don't have an answer for you. You've got to be willing to find the thing and the door that you're willing to walk through and then walk through it. These are all awesome answers. I hope y'all are taking note. Um, that's going to be on video. I realize I never introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Melissa Monahan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a recruiter here and our Yogler representative. Um, and this talk is for Yogler, G-Paws, and talk set. So I realize you might be like, actually, I know half the room, but it's fun. And you also, um, so, you also uh, teach the yoga here on. I also teach yoga every Friday. So, so plug, check it out. Plug that. Plug it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one last question, and then we have a l- couple minutes for audience questions, if you'll have any. So please take advantage of these experts. Back to the tech topic. Um, you know, as you know, Google's a tech company, um, and there's lots of us out there. So what would you like to see tech companies like Google or others do or invent to further innovate within the wellness space. So this could be a product, a campaign, advocacy, like anything that you think when we have these types of resources and platform, is there anything that you would hope to see us do? Um, Yeah, I think broadly, um, just thinking about diversity and getting out there to as many people as we can. um, And just, yeah, helping all different communities, engaging with tech and hopefully finding some use for it. I think practically, some, I know, I, I sometimes do think about this because when you're bombarded by so much, whether it's a thousand tabs in your browser or it's apps like shouting at you, like this idea of how can our devices become smarter to like switch off? Is there like an out of office mode? Your phone goes on and then you put it for X hours a day and your phone's just like no one can reach you. And then your phone sends them out of office saying, actually, Tom is offline for two hours, we'll get back to you at lunchtime. But like, how can our devices, how can software become smarter, whether it's, gosh, I should, sign, I should probably sign an NDA, actually, um, on this idea. Um, but like, um, even a browser, like, can a browser shut down? Or like, does your browser remind you every half an hour to take a minute to do something, whether it's a minute of meditation or something like that, just something is popping up? I think the pop-up thing can be really annoying. At the same time, as a reminder to like break your habits in a day, it's also quite interesting. So. I think, yeah, just something software-wise is helping us, that relationship with tech in a different way, reminding us to disconnect, I think, rather than just us letting it be owned and open more tabs and get more apps shouting at us. Like, how can we actually let our devices kind of, yeah, control us for a bit, I think. I like that. Yeah. Cool. All right, Google. (laughs) Okay, Google. (laughs) I've been waiting for Google to ask me this question for a long time. (laughs) So I'm excited right now. All right, Google, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is this. So this is a very um, uh, selfish request, but uh, it is in the interest of of all patients. And that is what we have seen in technology on the physician side of things in the past 10 years. There's been a lot of uh, incredible developments. and a lot of them we can hand in the, hold in the palm of our hand, but what I have been completely underwhelmed with um, is the, the lack of significant benefit of electronic medical records. So, you know, over a decade or so, this was the big boom in health industry, right? And it's now a billion dollar industry. There's several, there's too many to count uh, scores of electronic medical record systems, but what they are all really lacking is what we had hoped for in the first place. Really, the original intent is cl- clinical uh, decision support systems. Help physicians take all the data that is available to them and make better decisions with their patients, not for their patients. Um, and now we're seeing such a, a explosion of even more and more data. Genetics information is now available to us. Uh, Information regarding the microbiome in your gut. Um, I can go on and on and on with the different types of testing that we do in our more cutting edge practice. But the problem is, with more data comes more complexity. And there is no right answer for everybody. What doctors typically use are guidelines 
This is the historic way that doctors operate, and guidelines are basically based on population medicine, large studies. And so we need ways to integrate all of these things. The cognitive load for physicians is too great. There are too many factors to, to help people decide what are the best decisions for themselves, even whether it's diet or how to sleep or um, what kind of exercise to be doing. So. I think that the greatest revolution in the future moving forward will be AI uh, and other technologies that help doctors uh, take all this information and boil it down to the best recommendations for individual uh, patients. So there you go. I'm available to talk to, too, if you want. Yeah, that was amazing. I actually agree with all of that. And I'm going to take mine to a w way more entertainment lean. It's not nearly as critical for human <laughs> survival, but I love that. Um, no, I am very, as yoga today has always been sort of in the forefront of like production quality for, the, you know, bringing the user into an experience. We shoot in in 4K and nat national parks and people are like, is that a green screen? I'm like, do you realize how much work that was? It was not a green screen, okay? We're in with like flies buzzing around us and bison. Anyways, the point is like, I want to be able to use VR to give people in cities that aren't in these beautiful places the same experience because I can't describe to you what it's like to do a yoga show in front of the Tetons. Like to be on the show, you're just like, what is happening? It's so amazing. And like, you know, people just don't get enough connection in, with the natural world now that I'm trying living in cities. I'm trying to live in LA and it's like, it's different, you know? And so I want to give people that access to the natural world through VR. Um, I know they're already doing VR yoga in Korea. I'm gonna go check it out. Yeah, I know, it's so cool. Uh, I think it's more like animatronic and we want it to be like high production value and then we want the Google Glass to be able to just flip from like, I'm in the Tetons with them or I'm in a studio with a bunch of people and like after class be able to like make that connection face to face with people instead of, oh, I see 16 people are in this class with me, but I don't see them. Like, so I just, I am so excited about VR and like that's what I'm geeking out on right now. And that's where I want Google to come help us out. <laughs> cool. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I think uh, what I want to say is Google, keep doing what you're doing. Um, just being able to be up on a panel like this with um, other, uh, I think, health professionals and wellness, uh, well, wellness professionals and being able to talk about it, that's, that's already something that you guys are amazing at. And it's bringing, I think, more and more, of, I guess, bigger companies or bigger conglomerates kind of coming together and cooperating with one another, I think, to just help other human beings out. That's, that's all I ask that you guys keep doing. Um, you guys have so much power in the world. I mean, literally, you know, and um, such a cheesy line, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> uh, and, and, and in a sense, it, you know, the, um, doing what you're doing, which is trying to bring, you know, ease technology, make things better for human beings around the world. But I think it starts with the collaboration and the, and the, and the coming together, and that, that's huge. So you guys are already doing it. Just keep, keep doing it. And, um, realize the impact that you have on the world. That, that's, that's all I, yeah, I think that's all I got. And I think we could do more collaboration because yeah. like we can do this, but like, you know, sometimes we're competitive with other tech companies and we're not necessarily always working together to do that. And I know it's not one-sided on that. Yeah. You know, it's, it takes two to ten. Yeah, you know, so. but it's good. I like that. Yeah. It's good thinking. Uh, have you guys ever seen the show Black Mirror? Yes. yes. I love them. Yes. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I like... The, cause I, cause I, my brain goes like I cannot wait for my car to be the last car that I ever drive. Like I'm, I'm so excited about autonomous vehicles, and you know, I, driving. I love driving. It's not that I don't like driving, but I want to do it when I go to a racetrack for fun. I don't need to drive around town. You know, I can't wait to order up my car and my car shows up without a driver and takes me where I need to go. And then I never has to park. It can just be cruising around. You know, waiting to pick up the next person. Um. But Black Mirror, holy crap. Like, it just takes it to the next extreme, you know, like chips and being able to delete your memory and your, your people out of your life and kill people through technology. Like, it's just crazy. So if you haven't watched it, it's a great show to, well, maybe it's not a great show. <laughs> it's scary. It's a, it's a black, it's, a, it's black. 
Uh, but no, seriously, like I, I agree a hundred percent with what Dice said about being responsible, you know, like removing consciousness and removing, um, awareness from the human, making us less human through the use of technology would be a step in the wrong direction. And so I think being, uh, Google being conscious of, of what they're developing and how they're developing it. And then what's the, you know, we always have to think about rules when, as a, as a professional athlete, you're always, you, you tend to win things when you're either the fastest or you're the best at skirting the rules just inside the barriers of the rules. And I think one of the things with technology is, well, at least when, when we do it, is we have to think, well, how are people going to use this rule either in their favor or maybe not in their favor in order to score points or in order to you know, get a better score? And I think that's something to, that is very important that technology companies, especially ones with as much power as Google, ta you know, are aware of and conscious of. Those are great. It, this is a great panel. I'm just going to tell you. Um, so we are at one. Um, it, does anyone have questions? We have the really awesome. All right. I, I just want to throw it to you so they see what this is all about. What is yeah. what is the microphone. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh -oh. um, let's see. So I immediately forgot my question once I was put on the spot. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's kind of this paradox of wellness and technology being a thousand years old, and then also it seems like um, it's really advancing really quickly right now. Um, and so there's a lot of <clears throat> experimentation being done with both, and so with that we get fads, which are initially a good idea, but um, they might not have longevity. What are uh, some fads? that you can't wait to see uh, <laughs> go away forever, <laughs> be they socially or um, different apps or products um, in your respective fields. And then, uh, to be less cynical, uh, <laughs> what are uh, some things that you wish you saw more of or perhaps directions for your respective fields in the near term? I can answer that first one. Um, I don't think they'll ever go away, but they need to go away, is this idea that a diet can solve your problems. There's any one diet that's the right diet and that you can do it in four months or four weeks or eight weeks or like you'll do it and it'll be over and you'll achieve what you want to achieve and then you'll, you can get on with your life. It's just not true and it never will be true. And it's a it's a it's an it's a like a layer of an onion. You keep peeling it, peeling it, and keep working at it, and keep working at it. And it's a lifelong journey that you're on. Um, I'd love to see diets just die a quick death. I don't remember your second question, so I'll piggyback on that if if you don't mind. Uh, and I can pick on a couple of fads if you like. But but w one of the trends that I that I would like to see go away is just ex what, what Andy was referring to, is the overnight fixes, the magic bullets, the, the eight minute abs. Um, because, so as an example, partially we do year long memberships. Uh, and we have a membership model because we don't believe that people get healthy with one magic visit to a super smart doctor. Um, we think that it's a process, again, a cheesy line, but it's, it's a journey, not an event. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do is that people get on the trolley with this thing that we're going to develop. And like you said also before, um, we're going to pick that one door that you're willing to walk through. And so many people are just like, well, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do this. I want to get the most out of my first 30 days. You will get the most out of your first 30 days when you are successful at the most important thing that's standing right in front of you. I always tell people that you know, if I give you one thing to do this month, you have an 85 or so percent chance of successfully doing that. But if I give you just two, it drops to below 50%. And if I give you three, it's down to less than 15% as well. So um, putting one foot in front of the other, I think, is the best way to go. And then the thing that I'd like to see get, we, us get rid of is uh, gluten. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, but I do bring up I do bring up gluten free diets as an example of further educating ourselves because what I have seen with gluten is it's a fad it's a real thing I mean people have gluten sensitivities but uh, in the science that we're using and incorporating is that uh, not everybody 
is going to benefit from a gluten-free diet. There is a certain percentage of people that will. And what we've also learned now is that there's we, what we've suspected all along as physicians is that it might be gluten, but it's probably some other things in wheat. Uh, and now we can test for those things too. So I bring it up as sort of a joke, uh, and certainly it's a real thing, but it's not just that. And there's other things that we need to be uh, informing people about. And I'd like to answer the second question. One thing that I think is not going away, and maybe I'm just an eternal optimist, but I think it's mindfulness. I think as we dive deeper into AI and tech, and as our society leans harder on machine learning and all of this, I think we're A, freeing up our time um, so that we can act more productively, I hope, is, is what's happening. And, but, and that we're, we're going to be like moving more towards the mindfulness space and yoga and health and wellness and, and connection, human connection. Um, and I think people need it more and more as we are surrounded in like a media cloud we need to be able to separate, and people are recognizing that. And I feel really optimistic. I know, like, you look at the younger generation, and you're like, how is that possible? But I think there's going to be a tipping point with everybody. And I'm, I'm optimistic that that's going to stick around, I hope. Any other questions? I'll set mic back there. I know we're over time, but these are really great. Test, test. So I, th I think it's wonderful that a technology and fitness convention plays the devil's advocate and says, turn your phone off and find yourself, you know, and, and I love that. And I think all of you are wonderful and have made the most insightful, important uh, uh, recommendations to anyone who is either at a high level or starting and entering a door and where to go. Um, I think on the um, exact opposite direction, however, I would love to have all five, six of you with me at all times in my phone, constantly <laughs> monitoring me and maybe bickering among yourselves. Be like, no, 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 not CrossFit today. He needs a little head, you know, headstand and <laughs> breathe and you know what, eat this. But I know you ate gluten yesterday. You're processing it, you know? So like, when is that toy coming? Um, <laughs> okay. It's There's a price tag for everything. I mean, we, we're willing. That's, that's we're super willing. smart, super smart AI. I don't know about that. <laughs> It's not, though. It's an intuition, and you are all very intuitive about your clients and about having a relationship in a way that AI will never have. You can see it, I'm tired, or you can see it, you need this, or you can see it, you know what, just breathe, just think for a minute, you know? And I think uh, that is where we're going, um, and that, that's all. <laughs> I absolutely agree, and, and you're right. There are so many, and, and that's sort of what I was speaking to before, too, is that there are so many individual technologies out there, like Headspace, for example, that, it, that are just wonderful, like the yoga the, uh, businesses that we have here. Um, but there's, there's a lack of bringing those things together. Um, and I think that that is very cultural, because everybody sort of is wanting their business to move forward. But I do think that the, the salvation of us all will be the best technologies working together. Um, and so I, like you, look forward to, to those kind of collaborations and those products. Like Spotify, you know, eventually. Right, yeah. Took all everything and gave it to you, you know? It's, I don't know. Okay. feel like that. Uh, anything else? The other thing, it, I, I'm yeah, sorry, I don't mean please. to just keep jumping in, but yeah. it just reminds me, the other thing that, and this is sort of the model that we have created and are, are trying to expand, is that, um, A, there needs to be a paradigm shift. There's a great book out there. It's called The Patient Will See You Now. Um, and it's written about how the patient needs to be the center rather than the old paternalistic doctor telling the patient what to do, right? We're consultants. But we also work with health coaches who are part of our team. And I think ultimately the, the, the best team to work with uh, a member or a patient in the future would be a fitness person, a uh, meditation person, somebody that's doing the psychology, somebody that's making sure that they are doing safe yoga practices, interdisciplinary teams, which is not a novel idea, um, but it's not the norm. And I think it's going to need to be before we can really make progress. It's something you just said. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that one of the things we try to teach is the patient being responsible. I mean, the patient's the CEO of the company. The, co the CEO has to make the decisions. They don't, the CEO doesn't pass the buck to the board or, go, or to the chief. You might have a chief doctor. You might have a chief, ther uh, a trainer and a therapist and a yoga instructor. 
but you make the decisions. And I think very often we look to the experts as if they know more than we do. And people forget that, or maybe they never knew, that their intuition could perhaps be more powerful than even every book that was ever written by any Harvard expert or anybody else. Like they have to be responsible for making that decision. And sometimes it's the exact opposite of what everybody else is saying. But if it's in alignment for, for them, that's the best answer. So. Yeah. And in yoga, you are your greatest teacher. So I think, yeah, listening to all the experts, absorbing the information, but being authentic to yourself and your gut is ultimately, yeah, the best guide. I think that you've clued into this is a great assortment of people, which was my thinking. Um, uh, so what we'll do is um, once we have the video, we'll send it out so you have it, and then we'll include links to all of these their various companies and the you know social media and all of that, but only check it once a day, uh, and <laughs> so that you have the access and, and can even reach out and ask additional questions. Um, anybody else have anything you want to ask of these folks? Any parting words that y'all want to share past the wisdom you've already shared? Well, thank, let's give them a hand. Really amazing. <laughs>